Well, our first uh, session is about MicroMouse software. This is something which um, I was supposed to do last year and have said that I would do a few times, <laughs> never really managed to get around to. And the idea really is to try to describe the functional blocks that you need um, to build uh, a maze-solving uh, software suite. And if you've done this and you know this, maybe what I have to say is different, or maybe it's new to you. I don't know. Either way, it should be instructive, and if at any point you disagree, say so. Okay, and we can talk about what might be best. Um, so this is how I do it. It's how the vast majority of bits of code that I've looked at do it. Um, that doesn't make it right any more than any other group activity that people do without thinking about. Okay? It's just what it is. So let's just remind ourselves of what the, the, the challenge is. The talk is here so that people looking at it in the future um, may not have your experience. Um, so there's some basics to start with. And <clears throat> classic MicroMouse, 16 by 16 grid. All of the principles apply equally well to half-size MicroMouse at 32 by 32. Um, and the idea is to find the goal. One thing that you should start bearing in mind if you're not already is that the goal is not necessarily the center four squares. Okay, so if you're writing or adapting your software now, build that in because the half-size contest can have the goal anywhere, uh, and you might just as well cross that little bridge early on rather than try and patch it into some hardwired stuff uh, later. Once we found the goal, we have to optimize the route, and then we have to run it as fast as we can. And these are they're very distinct, separate phases involved. Finding the goal, optimizing the, your route or path, and then running it fast. And today, I'm not really looking at running it fast, because that's something you'll be able to do once you've done the other two, right? That's, that's kind of your problem. That's where the contest is in many respects. So a, a standard MicroMouse goal would look something like this. Uh, this was um, uh, this was the Apex maze from uh, a few weeks back uh, in the States, in Orlando. I think. Hmm? No, it wasn't. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah it's it is. turned yeah. around a bit, isn't it? If you, from where you normally look at it. Do we know who the <laughs> Sorry? Who's the author in the maze? Uh, probably, um, I've forgotten. Um, it's the same guy, not Tony oh, yeah. Calagero. Oh. Yeah, they're up. Not Dave Otten, no, not Dave Otten, because he no, runs. It's, it's been the same person for years. It's and the years same person who does them all the time. And one of the things you can always say about, nearly always say about the Apex Maze, is there'll be some long straights and there'll be at least two paths to the route. Uh, this particular one, just as a matter of interest, is a bit awkward because um, you end up, most, of, most mice end up exploring the long way round. I'm not convinced this is it, you know. No, there's something not quite right. No, this is top no. left. It's it's different. Yeah, not very different though. No, it's not, is it? I might have made a mistake with it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You all, you've seen mazes. <clears throat> um, and when we start, all we know, generally speaking, is where we begin uh, and where the goal is. So, what you're aiming for is to take that maze and generate some kind of map which says where all the walls are and some kind of cost function which will guide you on your way to the goal. Right? This is what you want to end up with before you're ready to do a speed run, ideally. In this particular case, the cost function is just the Manhattan distance to the goal area. Right? But if you, different mice use different methods, so you may have a weighted thing that says it's all very well to have one step between here and here, but if you want to go from 
up, up these, you might say, well, there's a turn here, okay, and that's going to have an extra cost. So you might weight that at two, but a straight away as one or something like that. So that's just, that's, there are ways to do that. Um, <clears throat> and different kinds of turns might have different weights. So up here, this can be done in a single turn, which is cheaper than two 90 degree turns, for example. Uh, and here, because you're looking at a diagonal, um, you might, one technique that people use is to actually go from wall center to wall center. So this might be a cost of seven, whereas this is a cost of 10, which reflects the Euclidean distance. Right? So there's lots of ways to do it. And I'm not looking at that today either. Right? Just pointing out that when you come to do the flood, which a lot of people incorrectly describe as solving the maze, you haven't, you've just, you've just flooded it, right? It's not a solution. Um, <clears throat> there are different ways to do that. So our mouse starts off in the start cell. And quite often, people just fling it down um, and press the button or whatever they do and set it off. And I would put it to you that this is not a good idea. Right? For several reasons. One is well positioned sensors, that is, sensors that are around about that kind of angle, may not be able to reliably see walls either side. Um, so you don't get any clue. Sometimes people um, use those initial walls for calibration. It's fine, risky, but you know, it's fine. And um, you don't really know. I, I have found over the years, maybe it's me. <laughs> I found it to be surprisingly difficult to get this properly positioned, accurately positioned. And if everything depends upon that initial positioning, then everything else is going to be wrong. So my preference, generally speaking, is to back the mouse up against the wall here. Okay? Always start off with it backed up. That doesn't help you with the lateral position, but you always know where this is. And by the way, if you're designing a mouse, if you make sure that the rear end of the mouse can always locate it perpendicular to this wall, so it shouldn't have a curved back, it shouldn't have lumps or protrusions, maybe two either side, so you can always make sure that it's flat against this wall, that would help. Your sensors will now definitely be able to see the walls, so if you want to be able to calibrate from them, you can. And as you're moving forward, if you're making use of this edge, okay, then you'll always see it. And that's an important consideration that we'll, we'll, we'll come back to later. Because where you see this edge will tell you where you are in this direction. <coughs> Which, by the way, to remember for later, that's x. However, wherever the mouse is going, x is in the same direction. And y is this way. So that's your initial position. And you start your mouse. How do you start it? Well, if you can avoid it, don't use a button. Because very few people are able to press that button without nudging their mouse off in one direction or another. So I and lots of other people use a sensor start where this is always going to be empty. You can just put your hand in front of the sensor, okay? see that that's occluded, take it away, and then you're off. That's by far the most reliable way to start it. And if you're testing, of course, you should have two of these sensors, so you can do different things depending on which one you pick. This is questionable under the rules, okay, in terms of choosing a strategy. But whilst I was preparing this, I went back and looked at a whole bunch of other mouse runnings and it's very common, quietly. You just don't notice it happening. All right? So one thing you could do, nobody can stop you, nobody can detect it. I don't, I don't know that there's any answer. It's a rule that should probably be amended in the sense that rules that can't be enforced shouldn't be there, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, but what I've, seen, what I've noticed people doing, I don't do this, what I've noticed people doing is starting on this side, for example, might mean do a search, and starting on this side might mean do a run. Mm -hmm. It's not an unreasonable thing to do. Uh, but when you're testing, if you're, if you're testing you know, left and right turns, 
Test the right turn, test the left turn. You get two for the price of one out of your startup. So anyway, <clears throat> this is straying from the point. Here's your initial position. You start the mouse, what does it do? Well, it has to start moving. And the first, and it starts moving with whatever your standard acceleration is, and it moves up for this distance, which is a parameter which should be somewhere in your code because you know always what it is. Okay? You always you should know how far it is to get from the back wall to the center. So you can make an initial move that says go forward at 35 millimeters or whatever, and end up if you if you can at your search speed. Okay, and then when you finish that, you are moving in the center of the cell, ready to begin your search. So it's just a little phase at the beginning. Then what? Uh, oh, by the way, um, this center position here is, is going to be your reference. And I try and set my mice up so that it just sees the edge just somewhere just after that. Right, so the sensors are aligned so that as I go through the center, I should be close to seeing an edge because that's, it's a handy reference point. Um, so the next thing then is to carry on moving until you get to some sensing point. Now for me, normally that's 5, 10, 15 millimeters ahead of the cell boundary. At this point, which you know is saying you know, 80 millimeters or 70 millimeters or whatever from that reference point. At this point, your sensors can definitely see any walls at the sides. These sensors will be able to see a wall ahead, and that's another critical parameter. Okay, that's where you measure your wall detection for your front sensors when the mouse is here, not here or here, but here. And you must be able to reliably 100% every time know that there is or is not a wall. And in case I forget to say it later, once you have marked a wall in, never change it. Because, well, why would you for a start? Okay? If you didn't see it before and now you do, what does that mean? If you did see it before and now you don't, what does that mean? Get your wall detection accurate in the first place and don't change your mind. And that means that you also must have a way of marking in your map that a wall has been seen or not seen. Right, so that's a software requirement that goes with it. Do, do anybody, uh, any mice, detect more than one cell force? Yeah, several people have done various things to do it for, for other reasons. Um, one uh, common reason, or one common thing, is to put some kind of long range sensor here so that you can go faster. Because, as we'll see in a minute, a constraint on how fast you can search is what happens next. Right? But some people have long-range sensors for that purpose. In the days when mice frequently looked over the top, it wasn't at all uncommon for people, as they went past here, um, to have a look into neighboring cells and see if there's a wall there, okay? just to save time. So if you have a look at the, the video of the APEC contest, yeah. um, Dave's mouse, which yeah, I saw that, uh, yeah. yeah, it's got these big sensors out the front. That's exactly what they do. They, they look at the wall over the edge you know, and map them in as they go, go down. Even, even if there's a wall on the right, you can put them in. It does say that it really just turned out not to be that useful, but, but that is what it does. <laughs> it's another one of those things that has to work absolutely or just don't even bother, because if you can't be certain, you don't want to know. If you, so you've sampled, in this case, you've sampled the left and right wall. Yeah. You know and the wall ahead. And you know definitely the state of them, so either there or not there. Yeah. So here it is, you could have a, could have a map that marked where you sense that particular wall. Yes. If you revisit it mm. and the state is different, you're in trouble. Does anybody say, right, I've been there, something's wrong? Mm. I haven't noticed. I mean, you know, I've looked at several chunks of mouse code. Um, but it's not a question I've ever asked anybody. Because there's lots of mice that run right. into walls. I, uh, they do that for all kinds of reasons. That's right. <laughs> yeah. but, you know, I, I have seen mice that definitely do do that. They, right. And they tend to slow down very slowly. But really, you, you want to fix 
you, you want to get it right problem. once it's right the next time you go past there hopefully you'll be going at a ridiculous speed yes. you don't want to be checking the walls at that point because you yeah. might not be in the middle or you know so um, but it's a, it's a good question and, and one that I hadn't really put in here much and that is about um, how how does your mouse software know that something has gone wrong yeah. right when what kind of crash detection do you have and what do you do about it there's one uh, a Japanese robot in particular, which is intriguing, because if he crashes, physically crashes during the search, we all know that generally that's, that's game over because you've no idea what's going on and your only option is to reset the map. What he does um, is the mouse orientates itself back in the cell by various maneuvers and so it's back in the center. Then I believe he clears, he doesn't really know where he is even, right? So he's, he, he does a procedure where he wanders around and compares what he sees with the map until he thinks he knows where he is, right? And then he can work back that little track of, of re-exploration, zap it all, and carry on. That's really clever. I was going to say, I mean, probably you're only talking about five or six cells that you've got wrong. You would hope. You could, you know, roll back those changes. To well, that's... A, that's another technique, right? If, if you make your map update a, a kind of command pattern thing with a queue of, or a list of update instructions, you could conceivably just go back five, six, eight, ten steps or whatever. Okay? But if you don't actually know what cell you're in, you're not, it's well, you not worth to, it. You need to do the search to find the cell. I mean, yeah. this is, the problem is that is it really worth doing this map engine? If you've got loads of spare time, which we all have, of course. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Then, then obviously these will be good things to put in, but in, yeah. you know. The first, the the first finish, really, yeah. really useful piece of, info, of mm. advice, well, not advice, it was a comment somebody made on the way back to the pub um, at, at a very early Minos. He, he said, as far as I can see, he was a newcomer, never been to any of these things before. He said, as far as I can see, the most important thing is to get all of your open loop stuff right and then work on closing the loop. And it's the same for this, right? Don't go wrong in the first place. Yeah. That's, that's the only absolute truth of the matter is. Um, do everything you can to avoid an error in the first place, and then you don't have to worry about how to fix it. Yeah. Easy to say, but that's what this is about, right? So, you're here now. Um, you're still moving. You're at exploration speed, whatever that might be for your robot. And at this point, you've got the map has been changed, probably. It may not, but it's probably been changed. And so now you need to flood the maze. People refer to this as solving, it's a misnomer. This is where you work out what costs there is between here and the goal, and then decide what to do next. Now deciding what to do next is usually a, um, an algorithmic choice. You could just say, I will always look for the least cost neighboring square and go there. Or you could say, I will always turn in whatever direction points me most nearly at the goal. Or you might say, I will always go straight ahead until I get past you know, row eight or whatever, and then I'll start to turn right. Or you might say, I'm always gonna try and go in a layer. I don't care. Whatever your algorithm is for deciding what to do next, that's up to you. That's part of the fun of it all. But you have to flood the maze and you have to gather enough information to make that decision. And depending on how you flood the maze, that takes time. And all of that time, your mouse is still moving. All right? So if you're exploring at 500 millimeters a second, which is a reasonable speed, and it takes you a tenth of a second to solve, to, to flood the maze, you are suddenly in big trouble because you're up, way up here. So this is why over the years I have stressed to people the value of a very fast flood. And you can flood the maze in tens of milliseconds, even on you know, a lowly Arduino. Uh, and if you're doing it in tens of milliseconds, you might only have moved two, three, four, five millimeters. And that's why I do this before this cell boundary, in the hope that I won't have gone any more than five or 10 millimeters past it by the time I've done whatever decision making I need to do. So then you have to decide what you're gonna do. And I looked at one point that um, flooding, flooding is a parallel process. Right. Uh, didn't, didn't do that. And, and 
now I don't because it just isn't worth it. <laughs> right? It, it can be. I mean, can, I, can I put forward a, an alternative view to that, which is that you make the decision with the flood that you already had. And 99.99% yes. of the time, that will be correct. And if it tends to end you off the wrong way while you're searching, it doesn't matter because you just go into a different one. With, so, one, so, with, a, with one caveat, I so would you, So you'll find that... Uh, if you well, discover this as a dead end. Things like mouse... Yes. Yeah, you see, well, but then you can, you can see that. You can see it's yeah. a dead end, so you just turn around. You don't, you don't need to do any flooding to tell you to do that. But mouse X will... Um, do that, and then it will do the flooding as it's going through the next move, which is forever. So you, your, your algorithm can yeah. take, you know, it's got to be done what, by moving forward one, but that for, that's forever yeah. in, yeah. in, in yeah. microcontrol yeah. terms. That, that was the theory behind what yeah. we to do. Yeah, and that's exactly what most of uh, my mice do. They, they make the decision to turn using old, the data as it was in the last square. And, yeah. Very rarely do you see something that looks a bit odd. Yeah. Some, I have seen it and I can put it down, but in the end, it doesn't make any difference. So these are choices. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, my choice was to get a fast enough flood that I always know. But if you want to do a preemptive choice and correct afterwards, that's fine too. Um, but either way, you're going to be passing this threshold at explore speed and you have to do something. It might be carry on, it might be turn right or turn left, or it might be come to a halt and turn back, or it may be that you've reached your target cell, right? and then you have to do something else. So let's suppose that um, we've come to here and we have to turn right. So if you have a pivot turn, Clearly, you need to move to the center, come to a halt at the center, and know that you're at the center, <laughs> as opposed to just hoping for the best. Um, spin right, and off you go. Not going to worry about that too much. Um, I'm going to assume that you want to show off and do nice, smooth, integrated searching turns. Um, and for that, you need to design a smooth turn. And the, the requirements of that smooth turn are that it must take place entirely within a cell. And if you design it, as I've seen people do, to go from this boundary to this boundary, you're in trouble because you may overshoot. Right? And then you'll end up too far over on the way out. So I, I make my, my search turns on all my mice have a radius, an effective radius, that is, of maybe 70 or 80 millimeters. All right, so I move to a point 10 or 20 millimeters inside this cell, execute the turn, and if all goes well, I come out of it 10 or 20 millimeters away from the boundary, which, by the way, is exactly the sensing position that I had before. All right? And I know how far this is because I've kept track from my reference point. Here I was at, let's say, 80 millimeters. I know that my turn takes place 10 millimeters after there, so I carry on until I've got to 110 millimeters. Do my turn. By pre-calculation, I have decided that when I finish it, assuming I've not gone wrong, I will be at a, a position of 80 millimeters again from this reference point. Right? When you come to execute this turn, you can rely just on dead reckoning or if there's a wall ahead, you can use these front sensors as a trigger. Okay, so another value that you would want to measure as a parameter in your mouse is when, this, when the robot is at the turn point, what value should these sensors see? All right, and you can use that as an alternative. Because you may be too far away, you may be not far enough for one reason or another, um, and you can decide on a priority. I'm not going to look at that today as to which one you trust, but do bear in mind that the illumination from the side wall will affect this. So on UK Mars bot, whatever this reading is, it's plus six if there's a wall on one side, just because of the extra kind of splashback from the, 
That's well, presumably just my that's, that's only if you're in the middle as well. If you're, if well, you're yes, not centered, if, if, if you're worse. I'm assuming that everything's going well, right? <laughs> Obviously, you could be off to one side, and we're not going to do that today. We're, we're going to do it open loop correctly, <laughs> and then close the loop. <coughs> so after you've turned, and I've just assumed that this is a pivot turn here because, um, well, actually I didn't. I just I forgot what the slide was going to look like. If we do a, a pivot turn, we should be, ideally, back at our reference point, stationary, and we do exactly what we did, exactly what we did when we got to this point here. Right? We take off with a target speed of, of whatever our search speed is until we get to there. If we had done a smooth turn, we would be there. That may fall short of your sensing point. If your flood is particularly fast, or if you're preempting, you can afford to make the boundary your sensing point. It's up to you. You, you pick these numbers. Okay? But, but what you should already be seeing is that we've got a loop of activity. We're always moving to the sensing point, doing the sensing, flooding the maze, deciding upon what to do next, and then doing whatever it takes to get to the next sensing point. Again and again and again. And in, in essence, that's all there is to it. <clears throat> there are some tricky bits, though. If, while you're doing this, you really want to be steering, tracking the walls, staying in the middle. It turns out that most tracking algorithms don't work well if you're not moving. <laughs> right? They rely upon some kind of forward motion for all sorts of reasons. <clears throat> Uh, it turns out that you don't have very long to do any steering here, for example, you've got 20 millimeters of movement. You might ask yourself if it's worthwhile. It turns out that there's interaction between the sensors and the walls. People deal with this in different ways. One, one approach is um, to always turn the steering on when you're going straight and then make sure that your steering works. Another approach is to only turn your steering on if you're doing a full cell, for example. Okay? Again, this is kind of up to you. Um, I don't care. UK MarsBot software, uh, as soon as it's doing a, this, even this straight, it just turns the steering on. It'll turn it off almost immediately, so little harm comes <coughs> to the robot as a rule. Yeah? I did tend to find, I mean, when, on my UK MarsBot, I did um, I tend to find there was cumulative errors when you're going through multiple lush games. That's that's because of this triggering business here, right? As soon as, you, as soon as you've got a slight forward error, it gets worse every time. And that's why I mentioned using the wall ahead. Okay? Uh, and if you get that right, you can remove all of those cumulative errors. Except that the wall reflectivity may change by 10%. Okay? So you'll be a little bit short sometimes, a little bit long other times. It should even out in the end. One of the things that you can do to find a good value for that threshold, by the way, is if you write a little bit of code or adjust your search so that it just makes a random turn, right, again and again, and never reaches the goal, and then log, when you start the turn, log the sensor value every time you start the turn. Take an average of that after 50 or 100 turns and use that as your reference point. That's what I do. Duncan. I, you said compensate the front sensor readings for side walls at the time. And I'm slightly confused. On my mice, only, it's potentially only one LED is going to be on at a time for one side. Yep. So I don't understand why there is a compensation. On for most of the, it depends on your sensor geometry and it depends upon your sensor device. Uh, UK MarsBot fires them off in pairs because it hasn't got enough pins to do them individually. Um, but most importantly, the sensors have, have got a much wider beam than is implied by that. And so there is some illumination of this wall included in the reflected light. All right, so if that wall's not there, you'll get a slightly lower reading than if it is there. Even if you just fired off this one sensor. So we take, um, I take a reading of the sensor 
with the LED off and a reading with the sensor with the LED on. It's the difference that matters. Yes. Now, as long as the LED only illuminates the front wall. But it doesn't. I use four degree ones. Sure. sure. I mean, in general, it doesn't, right? If you've got really tight beam sensors and they're faced very much to the front, then you'll probably be fine, right? But in general, that's not what happens. And I would assume that you're going to have to look for and make that correction, right? So just build it in. All I'm saying is it, it can happen, build it in, right? Because um, if you don't, and, and it does happen to you, you won't think to look for it. You also get reflection from the front, like reflecting off the, the front wall onto the side and back. And that it does, the closer you get to the wall, it, it changes things. Um, but it also, I don't know where your sensors um, uh, point, but if you look at that, the front sensors are not pointing not forward. Forwards, yeah. And there's a reason for that um, when you're doing diagonals yeah. or also when you're doing. Um, <coughs> long bits of um, you know, cone type things that can allow you to just to, to stop crashing from that. So, so the, 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 they're slightly put out, which makes all of this worse. It also um, offsets the possibility of specular reflection, mm. right? Never point your sensor straight forward because you'll get a peak, shiny peak, which changes too quickly. By the way, when you're in this position here, and, and you suspect you may have problems steering, you've got these two, right? The, bear in mind that the sense will be reversed, right? So if you turn left, that will get brighter, but that will get dimmer, right? So you have to reverse the sign. But you can steer, once you've got them set up, you can steer off these. And that's another thing that I do as I approach a wall, I switch from using the side sensors to the front sensors for steering. So, <clears throat> Suppose now we, we come to here and we decide we have to turn around and go back because the algorithm says so. Remember here, the only certain thing was if you were backed up against a wall. Well, I would suggest that it's a good idea if you turn around here, if you have to do a 180, is why having done that is to back up against the wall again. Do this gently and slowly so you're not knocking everything all over the place. And that can be a problem in a, in a loose maze. Uh, it can be a serious problem, so check <laughs> that you're not going to wreck the maze doing it. If you go swinging backwards at great speed, it's all over anyway. You may, depending on how grippy your wheels are and the speeds and accelerations you use, you may find it backs up but doesn't turn. If you're using a gyro for steering, the gyro may prevent it from turning because it's trying to maintain the attitude, right? And you don't know where you are. The reason for doing this is because you don't know where you are. So don't just back up by the amount of that set distance. Back up by you know, 70 or 80 millimeters um, until you're certain you're there. Then you're back in this loop again, starting from the very first position. Don't you have to be capable of spinning the wheels to this? Yes, but it would, be a, it would be an impressive mouse that couldn't. You might stall them, right? So you need to worry about that, but yeah. If, so I, I did that there because as I entered, I had previously checked, knowing I was going to have to do a 180, I had previously checked if there was a wall ahead. That meant that it was safe to back up against it. I can't just turn around and back up against it because if there isn't one there, I'm all the way over here, right? So instead, you, it, when you come into that position, you can look into the cell and you can say, I need to turn around, but there's no wall here. What do I do? Do I rely entirely upon where I was or, or what? Um, one thing that people do, I don't do this, but one thing I've seen people do is if there's no wall, they just back up some fixed long distance. You can back up, you know, by 150, 160 millimeters probably quite, quite safely. But I would suggest not backing up so far that these no longer see these walls. If you're turning around, there's a good chance there is a wall. So you might want to back up, let's say, 100, 120 millimeters. And then you know you have to go forward that same amount to get you back to this center position. 
and you have two things going for you. One is you've got a relatively long steering distance available to help get you back in line if you've, if you've messed up. And the other is hopefully there will be a gap here and again, you can use these side sensors to reference that to know that when, when you've met, when you've reached the middle. Okay, so those, um, really, that's the loop. That's the exploration loop. These are the things that you do again and again and again, and they have a small number of exceptions. Turning around in place being the major one of those. Hopefully, one day, you'll reach the goal. Preferably in the same session. So what do you do then? Well, it depends on whether you, you might have been looking for a group of cells or you may have been targeting an individual cell. Okay? But either way, you, you've reached the goal. What should you do? Different people do different things. Um, <coughs> there's no guarantee there's only one entrance to the goal area. So some people circumnavigate it. Okay, looking for other exits, because it might very well be that you've picked the worst one. Um, some people, knowing how big the goal area is, do stuff like, so if you've, if you've come in, um, you don't really want to come in and stop there when you do your speed run. So they might examine the goal area and, make, and change the target cell to one away from that. Right? There's, we can talk about why in a bit, but <laughs> it's, it's advantageous to not have to stop as soon as you get straight into the goal. Um, if you're in the half size contest where the goal area is arbitrarily large, what I have seen people do in their code is they, they create virtual walls inside it because there's nothing in there. There's no posts, nothing. Right? And if you stray into that area, all of your references have gone and you're doomed. So if you, if you pre-populate, because you know where the goal area is, right? You, you set it up in your, in, your, in your mouse before you start the contest. You can pre-populate it with virtual walls um, and make sure that you never try and go in that area. And that will help keep you out of trouble. So they, they tell you, if it's a big square, they tell you that whole square. Yeah, well, they tell you the two corners. Right. And it's a rectangular region. Do you know? It's in the rules. I knew the target couldn't be anywhere. Yeah. still Yeah. It can be. It can be any size. It's defined as a rectangle, defined by two opposite corners. Um, and in, if you look at the Japanese contests, you will see there's quite often large void areas, and they're there to permit me people to lean in and recover a mouse, because you can't. Can't put a foot or hand in those tiny cells, right? So that's that's one reason why those big open areas exist is to allow access to the middle of the maze. Um, so, you now have an important thing to realise is that you may not have an optimum route, but you do now definitely have a way to get from start to goal. You know that for certain. And so, depending on the rule set you're using and your own rationale, you may choose to just go straight back and then do a fast run. Right? And then optimize the, the whole thing later. Whilst you've got a good solid map with a known good route in it, you might want to just make use of it. This is also a good point if you have the capability in your, in your code, in your processor, to save a copy of the maze. So if the worst comes to the worst, what you see now should be correct, right? And you can always get back to it uh, and save yourself a whole bunch of exploration. It's all too common to see people, myself included, go wrong and then have to zap the whole damn thing. And it's stupid, really. If you have any way of saving the state of the maze at that point, that's when to do it. Not as you go along, by the way, necessarily, although there's nothing wrong with that, but this is a known good maze that you can run. So that's worth remembering. <laughs> oh dear. So ne your next job then is to optimize uh, the path that you're going to take. Uh, and how you do that is, is kind of up to you. The simplest thing to do is to search out 
repeat the exact same process with the start cell as the goal, as the target, and search your way back. That, if you run simulations with lots of mazes, and I have, the chances of you significantly improving the route are maybe 50-50 after that. You may not get much better route having done one search out and one search back. But if the rules are appropriate, as ours and Japanese rules are now, then as long as you don't run out of time, you might just as well wander around until you've got an absolutely optimal route according to whatever your standards may be. Uh, with one caveat, which is the more time you spend searching, the more chances are for you to crash. Right? So it's probably not a bad idea, once you get back to the start again, to make a speed run. At least get one under your belt, right? and then optimize again. And lots of people do that too. They just speed run, optimize, speed run, optimize, and so on. Um, another thing is, if you do your search, if you're optimizing and you do your search by coming back to the start, if you enter the start cell, next time you leave it, that's another run. You've only got five to do. So you may want to think carefully about setting your goal to be the cell just outside the start as you optimize, right? So you get back close to it, which, which amuses people no end, by the way. Um, when I've done that, it does all this stuff and it comes back and it gets one cell away from the start and turns around and they go and they're all convinced that you've messed up and you're one cell out but really you're just trying to save runs oh, but you don't try to back up when you're there. no that would be that would be um, that wouldn't be a good thing to do um depends on your on your rules um another thing that you can do is because you have been carefully marking known good walls then you can go and you can create a possible path and, and if it tries to go through any of these unknown walls, you can go and visit that cell. So you actually you set, and I would suggest to you that in time that's your better option, but it's more complicated. You would really make a list of cells that you want to visit and you set them as targets one after the other until you've seen all of those and that list will change. But that's, you know, that's not an advanced thing, but it's not a first step thing. Right? Just do the search out, search back first, and it'll get you most of the job done. If you can do that, then you can do the other stuff. Right? It's all about stepwise refinement. Um, so, I said earlier, never change a wall that you've seen. Mark which walls you have seen as seen, and that gives your walls four states. Unknown, known absent, known present, and because you've used two bits, however you've done it, You've got a fourth state, which you might as well call a virtual wall, which is presumed to be present, regardless of whether you have seen it. And you can use that in the goal area. Um, choose a speed for all your smooth turns, and if you want to make life easy for yourself, refine that turn at whatever speed you can manage, 400, 500, 600 millimeters a second, and then set that as your search speed for everywhere else so you never have to worry about speeding up and slowing down. You just do everything at the same speed, right? And if you can only turn slowly, you search slowly. Worry about improving that after. Um, there's ways to do it, easy ways, hard ways, but at first, just search at your turn speed. Don't make life more complicated. Than it. It's difficult enough already. Um, Whilst your mouse is wandering around, you need to record stuff. You need to keep track of it. You obviously need to know which way you're heading. You obviously need to know which cell you're in. Um, and you need to know your position in a cell. This is to that reference. So what I do, for example, is if I, if I call that reference point 90 millimeters, you call it, it could be zero, it could be 90, whatever you like, as I'm moving forward, if I have to move forward a full cell, right, I allow that distance counter to carry on. But as I'm going into the next one, I just subtract 180 from that. Right? I don't try and set it to be zero or whatever. I just subtract 180 from it. Uh, and that will automatically make this uh, a number relative to your reference point all the time. Does that make sense? No? Okay. Um, 
Another thing you can do is, um, I should have mentioned earlier, your algorithm may, when choosing where to go, it may just choose to, to try and visit unexplored cells. If you're keeping track of which ones you haven't seen the walls in, you might just want to try and visit those. If, you, if you've got no other better option, go, and, go, go somewhere new. Try something different. Um, and if you can, log everything. If you've got Bluetooth, just blast it all out over a Bluetooth connection to your PC. 115 kiloboard is quite fast enough. Even on a UK Mars bot, you can send out um, uh, 60 character lines almost continuously at, at that speed. It's a convenient speed to use. Um, right, speed running, which I need to do because I'm already beginning to overrun now. Um, we've talked about this once before. Uh, not that everybody was here then, but um, you can, if you want to do your, your first attempt at a faster run, when you have flooded the maze, you can look ahead and say, I'm going to be going forward now. And then you can say, what will I do in the next cell? If that's forward as well, then I could do two cells, right? Or three or four or five. And then there are a couple of approaches. You can either adjust the speed depending on how many cells there are ahead. These are known cells, right? So you can go fast, you're not mapping, you don't care. Or you can take Derek's approach, which is teleport yourself uh, into these cells, uh, to use his words, which means if I, have to, if I can go four cells, that's 720 millimeters, and I don't have to do anything, right? As long as I can go 720 millimeters uh, and keep track of which cell I'm supposed to be in, I can do that at whatever speed I like. And then when I get to the other end, I have effectively teleported. Uh, I'm now in this cell at this position, and I carry on. Right? So these are ways that you can speed it up. <clears throat> um, how do you know if you've got an optimum solution? Well, remember, you've kept track of whether you have seen the walls or not seen them. If you assume all unseen walls are block, are there, right, so the exit's blocked, and you try and calculate a path, or flood the maze, you'll get a cost in the start cell, yeah? If you then assume that all of the unseen walls are not there, and flood it again, you'll get a cost, yeah? And in general, they might be different. If they are the same, you don't really care whether you've seen walls or not seen walls because your path no longer has to go through unseen walls. All right? So do it with these two different assumptions. And if they're the same, you have a solution. That's why I distinguish flooding from getting a solution. And then you have a path that's not going to get improved. There's no point in exploring anymore. Go back, get your speed runs in. Um, to do that, there are a couple of different ways. Some people store the wall bits in the lower four bits um, of a byte, one per cell, and then use the upper four bits to, to store presence information. Okay, a little bit of bit masking and shifting and shenanigans will let you distinguish known good and known not good walls. Uh, and if you know all of the walls in a cell, then you can just write ones into all of these, so you all that byte with F0, and that says, well, I've seen all those walls, off I go. Or you can keep them separate and use uh, bit fields, um, and that semantically is easier to read. That's all. Um, flooding should be fast. We've already said that. Um, don't care about that. Now, technically speaking, um, that's it. Uh, and I've used up my time. I have, I can run through a version of the code, but I've overrun badly. So if anybody wants to do that later, we can. But otherwise, I'll, I'll pass on to whoever's next. Quick question about checking whether it's optimal. Yeah. If you flood the path and you have visited every one of those cells on the flood path, that tells you you've got the optimal path. Um, they slide. Um, yes, it, 
it um, that's the way I've done it in the past. It depends on how you're tracking the walls. Yeah. Really? So if you've got these two bits, right, then you 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 use a bit mask or, or by whatever technique um, to only examine known. And by the way, stop thinking about looking for walls. You don't really care about the walls. This is this is a a little bit of an epiphany I had recently after years and years of doing this, just to show that you never stop learning stuff. Stop thinking about looking for the walls. All you care about is the exits. Right? This is a, this might strike you as a splitting hairs, but in the code it's easier to think of if you only ever say, is there an exit, rather than is there a wall? Because it's only if there's an exit can you go through it. Right? And, and an ex using the two-bit scheme that we had uh, back here, right? An exit, a known exit is always zero. Where it, and all the other cases are not zero. So rather than checking for three different cases, you're only actually checking for one now. Is it a zero? Is it really an exit? Can I run through it? It's just a perspective thing. Okay. Just a question about that. Like keeping on yeah, parallel with the wall and navigating that. One thing I've noticed on my new mouse that I'm working on is that when I get to a gap where there isn't a wall, sometimes that can like just turn the mouse that's the, slightly. That's, the, the, that's for this down. afternoon. This oh, afternoon okay. we'll be talking about wall and, and line tracking. And oh, we'll, right. we'll look at that because it's a real problem, yeah. right? But yeah, we'll be looking at that.